Welcome to this Bone Matters session on the ever popular topic of exercise and physical activity for bone health and for osteoporosis. Today, I'm delighted to welcome two experts in the field who I have been working with closely to produce some new exercise information resources for you. And we're going to tell you a bit more about these films and discuss some of the topics that they address. We have a wide range of films and fact sheets uh, that have been available for many years. We developed them um, and they have been very well received and evaluated. But we're really going to try with these new films to fill in some gaps um, and help give you more of the information you need. So let's get going. And I'd like to start by asking my guests to introduce themselves and just tell us where they work and perhaps how their work links in with exercise and bone health. So let's start with you, Catherine. Thank you very much, Sarah. My name is Catherine Brooke Wavell. I'm an academic in the uh, National Centre for Sport and Exercise Medicine East Midlands Hub based at Loughborough University. Uh, my main area of research is on the effects of exercise on risk factors for osteoporosis, bone density, but also other risk factors of, of bone strength, balance, etc. Thank you. Lovely. And Richard? Hi there, Sarah. Thanks for the opportunity to join you today. Um, yeah, my name is Richard Blagrove. I'm a senior lecturer in physiology. I'm also at Loughborough University. And my research and practice around exercise and bone health is looking at the role of muscular strength and strength training in improving bone health and endurance runners. Um, and I'm also interested in whether strength based exercise can be used to improve markers of bone health in individuals that have got very low energy intakes or those that are recovering from a syndrome known as relative energy deficiency in sport or an eating disorder. Thank you. And I maybe take this opportunity to just thank you again for all the work you've done with me and in, in producing these these resources it's been really interesting and and you know, really invaluable your input so thanks right so we've do, talked before in our information about how exercise can help with osteoporosis we've talked about something that we've called strong steady and straight so exercise to promote bone strength to keep us steady so we're less likely to fall over, but also how to use exercise to care for our back, to that safe moving and lifting to reduce the risk of bones breaking, but also to help after we've had spinal fractures. In our new films, we have focused on exercise to help build, keep, and even improve our bone strength. Um, and this is something which I know is going to be very interesting for lots of you listening. And we're going to start at the very beginning, perhaps with a slightly cautious note, just to make sure we're not going to mislead or overpromise. Catherine, can I ask you to answer a very common question, which is, can we really be certain if we've got osteoporosis or we've already got weaker bones, that doing exercise is going to improve our bone density and our bone strength? Yeah, ideally, if we wanted to prove that exercise is going to uh, prevent osteoporosis, Ideally, we want research studies in large groups of people so we can see do exercise, does exercise reduce the risk of having a fracture? And we don't really have those huge studies that there are for some of the studies for some of the osteoporosis medications where there have been enough me people measured so we can be sure about how many fractures are prevented. Also, for the studies we do have, um, more of them being conducted in healthy postmenopausal women rather than specifically people with osteoporosis. And said that there, there is evidence looking at effects of exercise on bone mineral density. And some of that evidence shows benefits from some types of exercise, but not from other types of exercise. I think an important thing to bear in mind is that the studies haven't shown that exercise alone is going to take you from being osteoporotic, having an osteoporotic BMD, right up to being normal. So it can have a, a benefit, but a modest benefit for some types of exercise. And obviously not being certain, as you said, that it's going to be enough to reduce your chance of breaking a bone, which is what we're aiming to do. And I guess that's where we just, as you say, need to reassure people that 
uh, they may need to consider a medication if they're in that higher risk group. But nevertheless, um, so people might say, well, what's the point? If we can't be sure, why bother? Um, so tell us a bit more about where the evidence does lie and how it can, exercise can help your bones. Yeah, yeah, I think the first point is that if you're inactive, you like to lose bone. And uh, by increasing the activity, then um, you're likely oh, sometimes that exercise can increase the bone density. The studies show that people who exercise regularly have lower rates of some fractures, such as hip fractures and people that don't, which could be through exercise increasing bone strength. It could be through better muscle strength. It could also be because exercise affects lots of other health conditions as well. And those health conditions could co contribute to osteoporosis as well. So there's definitely evidence for exercise having benefits in a range of ways. And also that some types of exercise that create forces in bone will increase the bone density. Thank you, Catherine. So that brings us nicely on to the two types of exercise which are really best if we want to help our bone strength. Um, I'm going to ask you both to talk about these. Um, we know, Catherine, that uh, weight bearing exercise is good for bone, but in the new films, we've really taken that a step on and talked more in detail about impact exercise, weight bearing impact exercise and how that might be helpful. Could you talk us through that a bit? Tell us about this weight bearing impact exercise and particularly perhaps how more moderate impact might be best for our bones. Yeah, when you do an activity such as walking or running or jumping, when your foot hits the ground, forces then go up through the skeleton and the skeleton can adapt to those forces. And the so we call that impact forces. And those can be fairly low if you're doing something like walking, where you've got both feet on the ground at the same time. Um, or they can be higher if you're jogging, for instance, that'll put greater forces on the bone. Or at the other extreme, if you're jumping from a height, that will put really high impact forces on the bone. And it seems that moderate impact forces, things like doing some hops that we've done in some research studies, can benefit the bone mineral density particularly. And those are more effective than the lower impact. And we can do those in some of our research. We found that doing just 50 hops a day that takes only a few minutes um, is able to increase bone density. So you don't have to do large volumes of this type of exercise to have a benefit. Thank you. And I think we know uh, that some people are already doing those types of exercises or doing a, a sport or leisure activity that includes that type of exercise. But in our new films, we developed what we called a, a three stage plan for anyone who felt they need, needed a bit more guidance, really, and to explain these principles in some more detail. Sarah, can I just explain about the four short films that have been put together? Uh, there's one introduction that gives a general overview explaining some of the principles. Then there's one on low impact exercise. This might be a good starting point and should be suitable for just about everyone to do. It gives some examples of low impact exercise that you could do. The next one builds up to moderate impact that might be suitable for people without vertebral fractures and to people who might have been more active. And this demonstrates how we can increase the amount of impact to generate greater response in the bones. And then the final film gives some more examples of more advanced moderate impact exercise. And what that really is really trying to do is increase more variety because to increase the strength of the bones in all directions, we want to have different directions of forcing and force acting on bones rather than a single repetitive movement. But all of these films are just giving examples really to give a feel for what constitutes low impact or the moderate impact. But there might be other activities that you do in everyday life that have similar effects to these exercises. So, so thanks for explaining that, Catherine, really useful. And we'll perhaps come back in a minute to some of the safety questions about uh, can I really do that type of moderate impact if I've got osteoporosis? 
So let's go on to the other type of exercise, which is the muscle strengthening exercise. Richard, can you explain explain this to us and perhaps explain this term progressive muscle resistance exercise, which is a sort of complicated term, but an important one. Give us a bit more uh, detail on that. Yeah, sure. So resistance training is basically any exercise activities that make the muscles work harder um, against a weight or an external load. Uh, with the aim of trying to uh, improve muscle and bone strength. And this term progressive essentially just means that the resistance or the loads that we're trying to lift or move uh, during the exercise should gradually increase over time, because obviously the muscles and bones start to adapt and become stronger. So they need more resistance or load in order to further improve strength. Um, so with, with novices, our own body weight pr probably does provide enough resistance to movement. So with those that are, that are unaccustomed to performing strength training, they can just use body weight initially uh, to improve muscle and bone strength. However, fairly quickly, muscles and bones get stronger. So you need to add external resistance in the form of elastic resistance bands or free weights like dumbbells, barbells and kettlebells. Um, so you can overload a little bit more. Thank you. And just to say, uh, we'll be giving you a full list of all our new exercise films below this this film. But um, we do have two films, one on how to use resistance bands and how to use weights and really explaining the very much the basics about how to get going with those. Uh, so I think that will be re a really useful starting point for those of you who feel you need to know more. Thanks, Richard. So that's progressive muscle resistance exercise. Now, within our uh, our four films on how to build up muscle strengthening exercise, we talk about four main groups of exercise that it's worth thinking about. And we uh, explain how it's useful to choose an exercise from each of these groups. Um, and within our three stage plan, we talk about how to build up and gradually increase the intensity and make the work that our muscles are doing harder. And this is best for bones. So perhaps you could talk a little bit more, Richard, about these four groups of exercise, what they are um, and, and how they work to help promote bone strength. Yes, yeah, certainly. So we've got two uh, exercise categories which mainly work for muscles of the lower body. So that's the hinge and the squat and then two mainly upper body exercises and we've categorised those as pull and push. So the hinge exercises are really important movements to strengthen the spine and it mainly works the muscles in the bum and the back of the legs and some of the muscles in our back as well. Um, the squat exercises also strengthen muscles of the spine and it's a really important exercise to strengthen all of the muscles in the lower body really. Um, push exercises as I mentioned is an upper body exercise and it mainly trains the muscles in our chest, the front of the shoulders and the back of the arms um, and these are important for strengthening bones in the wrist and the forearm and also the spine um, a little bit too. And then lastly we've got pull exercises which train the muscles in our back and arms and these are also good for building bone strength in our arms and the, our, our spine. Great, so what it's all about, I guess, is, is working on all the main muscle groups. And that's what we've tried to do by providing these these different groups and telling people how to select. Is that right? So it's all the main yes, muscles. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, it covers across those four categories. It covers pretty much all major muscle groups and areas of the body. We also include three other groups of exercises which are not aimed so much at strengthening bone, but they are important. Uh, Richard, can I ask you just to explain what they are and what they do and perhaps how often people need to do them? Yeah, sure. So as you say, we've got these three categories of kind of supplementary or assistance exercises, and those are brace, lunge and stepping exercise. So the, the brace exercises are essentially exercises that specifically target the trunk or the torso muscles. People might refer to those as, as kind of core stability muscles. And those will help strengthen postural muscles in that area and will also assist with, with helping on some of the main exercises that we've spoken about. Um, the lunge exercises focus on strengthening just one leg at a time in a kind of lunge or exaggerated step positions. Um, and these are good for strengthening the muscles in our bum and on the front of our legs in particular. Um, stepping exercises, as the name suggests, are variations of kind of stepping upwards onto a higher level, um, such as a box, a step um, or a sturdy chair. 
So again, they train one leg at a time and strengthen pretty much all of the muscles we've got in our lower body. Um, and similar to the main four categories of exercises that we spoke about, people should try and ensure the weights or the load that they're using on these exercises progress over time. Um, and we've got variations of the exercises to challenge people in different ways on the videos as well. And finally, on these exercises, we suggest that you pick uh, two to three of the exercises within each of the resistance training sessions that you do to supplement the main exercises that you've got in your programme. Great. Now, people with osteoporosis might be a bit surprised that we're talking about lifting dumbbells and barbells and thinking really can, you know, are they not too heavy for me? Will they cause a spinal fracture? Perhaps, Catherine, you could start by explaining why we have included these. A bit about the evidence, maybe. Yeah, yeah. the research evidence suggests that to increase bone density, we do need to be using a force that's greater than our everyday life. And so with a, a heavier load, we generate a, a greater bone response. So, of course, it needs to be done gradually and building up gently. Thank you, Catherine. That, I think that really helpfully explains about the evidence and, and how using weights uh, it certainly may help to promote bone strength. But we do have these safety questions and people worry that weights might be too heavy. Richard, could you explain a little bit more about uh, lifting safely? So what, what we're certainly not suggesting here is that people go and join a gym and start picking up very heavy weights straight away. It's, it's really important that initially people just focus on learning the movements and trying to gain some confidence on the exercises that we've outlined at stage one particularly in terms of keeping your back straight and trying to move in a smooth and controlled manner. Um, and then as movement competency improves, people can start adding some form of resistance by holding elastic bands, which are mostly our stage two exercises, and then progress to using some light dumbbells or a barbell as part of our stage three exercises. And ideally at this stage, people should also try and seek some instruction and coaching from a qualified practitioner in a gym-based environment if they can. Thank you. Right, let's move on to a slightly different question. Uh, we have been asked about, uh, well, what about people who can't afford to buy equipment? Can they use uh, things that they find around the house at home? Will that be good enough? Richard, yeah, so it at, at stages one and two, the majority of exercises that we've suggested are actually just performed with, with body weight. So these can obviously be done at home with, with fairly minimal equipment. And then at stage two, we suggest that the resistance on most of the exercises is um, elastic resistance bands, which people can pur purchase fairly cheaply um, online. And then as you adapt and become stronger, um, it becomes a little bit more difficult to load the exercise with enough resistance to create an, an adaptation and to make it challenging. Therefore, it's advisable that people purchase either some light dumbbells that they can use at home to progress the exercise or they, they join a gym facility and, uh, and get a membership at a gym. Um, having said that, we appreciate that not everybody can necessarily afford to join a gym or has got the motivation to sign up for a, a gym membership. So there's heavy implements that you can use around the home that can be uh, used as an alternative to load the exercises. I think we appreciate that not everyone is able to uh, start using weights and jumping and jogging and whatever exercise you choose to do has to fit your own fitness and your own situation. But we are aware that there are people, women perhaps around the menopause, fitter people on into their 60s and 70s who really do want to build up and continue with perhaps more intense levels of exercise. Um, and they need a bit of reassurance that it's safe to do that. Uh, any other comments you'd like to make on that, Catherine? Yeah. Yes, it's important to realise that um, you don't need to stop exercising. In fact, um, you should give yourself permission to be able to exercise. Um, we know that not exercising or reducing the amount of exercise you do might increase bone loss. So it is important that you can continue uh, the vast majority of what you can, you're doing. You should be able to continue safely. Um, the most important thing is to avoid inactivity and to try and include some different types of activities 
They could be some of the activities we've got on here or some everyday activities such as dancing, for instance, or playing tennis, something that you enjoy so that you'll carry on doing it. And as regards dancing, there's a very nice film that I understand will be coming up soon, produced by the Royal Osteoporosis Society. So do look out for that one. Yeah, watch this space. Uh, other things coming too. So, that's a, so that should be useful for some of you. Yes, and I think the safety issue is a huge, um, it's one of those questions that everyone asks. And I think one of the important starting points for all these resources is that we want to try and dispel the myth that everyone with osteoporosis is going to snap or break and really cannot do any of these moderate type impact exercises. Um, and that really isn't the case, although we can't reassure everyone that everything is completely safe. I don't know if you want to say a bit more about that, Catherine, because there are some groups, aren't there, for whom we do suggest you stick to the lower impact. And that's that's going to be people who we are pretty certain have got much more fragile bones. So perhaps if you've broken a bone or had a, a spinal fracture already. Do you want to talk a bit more about that, Catherine? Yeah. yeah. For those people, for instance, who have vertebral fractures um, or who've had multiple broken bones, then it is sensible in that case to be a little bit more cautious without thinking you need to be totally inactive. So what you might want to do is stick to the low impact type exercise and avoid doing the moderate impact exercise. Uh, you can still do some of the muscle strengthening type exercises. Make sure whatever you're doing that you're building up gradually and doing it safely. Uh, have a look at some of the films on safety from the Royal Osteopro Society. And it's also important to think about lifting safety. If you're using a weight, make sure that you're careful, not just when you're doing the exercise, but if you're getting it in place to start using it or picking it up from the floor. And so have a have a look at the films on safe moving and safe lifting to support the exercise that you're doing as well. And just one final point for me about those people who do want to go back to moderate impact exercise who have had spinal fractures. It's not absolutely clear cut, but we do cover this in a bit more detail in our new safety film. So have a look at that. So thank you. I think that's given a really good overview of the whole topic and some of the principles that we have discussed in in detail when we set out to produce these new films. Um, right. Time for a few questions for, from our members. Um, I've got a first question for you, Richard, which is, um, can you talk a bit more about what's the weight you should be holding when you do some of these um, exercises? So we see uh, the the trainer holding um, a weight whilst doing the hinge and the pull and the push. And what kind of level of weight are they using for that? Yeah, sure. So as, as we've already said, with progressive resistance training, we need to be applying a force to the muscle and the bone that's greater than what we're accustomed to or used to in, in everyday life. So the intensity that's recommended in the literature is to try to work between about eight and 12 repetitions. Um, or in other words, the maximum weight that we can lift for between eight and 12 repetitions. Um, in the recommendations, we say that people should be doing several sets of the same exercise. So if you can pick the weight that you can lift about 12 times and then perform several sets of eight repetitions, that's probably going to work your muscles quite hard and you'll feel like you've done something after that. And therefore, muscles and bones will be able to adapt to that. And then as you become stronger, you can gradually increase the number of repetitions you're doing at the same load up to about 12 before increasing the load and then reducing back down the number of repetitions again. Thank you. That's very really clear. Right, I have another question. This is from Caroline, who really, and this is something we often get asked, is how can I find a personal trainer um, with experience of osteoporosis? Um, so someone who will have all this information and they can feel confident will advise appropriately. Any any comment at all about that? Richard, maybe, or Catherine? Um, yeah, in some areas, you might find that uh, your GP can refer you to an exercise referral scheme with osteoporosis, and then you'll be referred to someone with appropriate expertise. Otherwise, if you've got a gym near you that offers these exercise referral schemes, they uh, may well be able to um, point you towards an instructor with the appropriate level of qualification that's used to working with people with conditions such as osteoporosis. If those don't apply and um, maybe what you could do is take some of the resources from the Royal Osteoporosis Society and show them to an instructor or trainer. 
we will be doing some work to hopefully promote these new resources so they can, can be used uh, by individuals as well as by trainers. I think, Richard, you agreed you thought that would be a useful way forward. Um, yes, yeah, certainly. It's signposting trainers and practitioners that work in gym facilities to these resources and the prescription of the exercises that go alongside it um, should be quite useful. And then I, I think a lot of fitness instructors, personal trainers, should understand the technique associated with some of the basic exercises like a bridge, the wall press, the band assisted row and the sit to stand. So you should be able to make some subtle modifications to your form and provide some feedback on um, on how you look on those exercises. And I think we also find that sometimes trainers and have the same kind of concerns around safety. So I think some of the discussions we've been having about what is OK to do are going to be useful, too, for trainers as well as for individuals. Yeah. So, OK, there's a number of questions about exercises that target the spine. Um, and some of these are indeed people who've perhaps had spinal fractures and perhaps do need some specific advice, perhaps from a physiotherapist, because they're looking at rehabilitation. And we do have quite a number of resources on our website that from our existing uh, suite of publications that should be useful. Um, but we have got one or two questions here about which of these exercises, can I be confident the exercises are going to help my the bones in my spine. Any any comments on that one? Perhaps, Richard, you could talk a little bit about the muscle strengthening exercises. Yeah, sure. So the, there's a lot of exercises in the resource that strengthen the back either directly or, or indirectly. Um, in particular, the squatting exercises, particularly the, the barbell back squat and overhead barbell press are very good for directly loading the back and the spine. And then also the Romanian deadlift, um, the brace exercises that we've got and the upper body pull and push exercises also strengthen the muscles in the trunk and the back a um, little bit more in, indirectly, but still equally as effectively. Thank you. Anything you wanted to add to that, Catherine, in terms of this concern that, yes, I feel the impact is, is focusing on my hip and my lower body, but what about my upper body and my spine? I think another important factor for the spine is to uh, make sure you're strengthening the muscles that keep the spine upright. And some of uh, the Royal Osprey Society resources on the key, the exercise to keep the spine straight will also be helpful in addition to the ones that Richard mentioned. Yeah. Thank you. Now on to another really common question. Valerie says, is walking going to be good enough to help me strengthen my bones? Walking is a fairly low impact form of exercise and um, in people and most of us regularly do walking as part of our everyday life and we're unlikely to see very much benefit from doing more walking unless we're already very inactive. Um, so it'd be better to supplement the walking with other types of exercise with some more moderate impact if if you're in the groups that are suitable for that. Uh, exercise where you're moving in different directions to load the bone in different directions and dancing, for instance, or particularly some of the muscle strengthening exercises. Thank you. And this one ties in. Jill says, I'd like to ask if taking up running in my 50s will be better than walking. And I guess you've you kind of answered that question. Uh, but I, perhaps another question which links to it, and you may have some comments, is people do worry a bit about their joints. Kate says, I really am worried about my worn knee joints. I can do a bit of walking. Uh, oh, no, walking is uncomfortable, but otherwise fine. But jumping in is out of the question. What, what can I do? Um, I think, Catherine, you were going to talk a little bit about strengthening joints. Yeah, yeah um, for a lot of joint conditions, we don't know exactly what it is, but one of the key things that you can do to help the joint is to strengthen the muscles around the joint. And so the best thing to do might be to look at muscle strengthening exercises and see if you can find some exercises that might help the joint, but also help the bones at the same time. Ideally, if you've got access to a physiotherapist, they might be able to help you to find appropriate exercises to do that. Or else you could look at the resources and see if there are any of them there that work for you. Richard, did you want to add anything to that? I know it's a common concern, isn't it, about what's running and moderate impact going to do to my joints? Yeah, I mean, certainly the hip dominant exercises, so the hinge category of exercises are 
less likely to aggravate very worn knee joints, particularly if it's, it's causing pain. Um, so those could be the ones that uh, this person prioritises initially. But as, as Catherine said, it's probably a case of trying out different lower body exercises that load the knee a small amount, try and strengthen some of the muscles around there and then gradually progress over time um, when it's the exercises are, are causing less uncom un uncomfortableness and, and pain. Yes, and I think one of the things we've, we've alluded to is that although it's ideal to do a combination of muscle strength and impact, there's going to be some people who really can only uh, do one aspect of and really anything you do is better than nothing and uh, you know, choose what's right for you. Uh, I think you'd agree with me there, wouldn't you? Yeah. Good. Well, I've got one final question um, and this is about machines in the gym. Maybe this is for you, Richard. Um, if you have yeah. osteoporosis, can you use the exercise machines in the gym? If so, um, will they work and are there any I should avoid? Yeah, there's um, most of the exercises that we present in our resource are using body weight and elastic resistance and, and free weights. Um, so that would, I think, be our preference because we know that those work a greater number of muscles, like all the ones that stabilise and fixate joints that aren't working directly. They have a higher carryover to sort of everyday living movements and tasks. And um, they don't kind of dict dictate the joint positions and the movement path that you take during exercises, so they're less likely to cause injury. Um, all of that said, there's definitely some scientific literature that has used resistance machines for muscle strength training very effectively. Um, and so if that is this person's preference and they, they're able to master good, form, master good form and technique fairly quickly with resistance machines, that's certainly going to be better than doing nothing at all. Um, However, over time, I would try to incorporate like maybe a combination of both. So some of the free weights exercises that we've got in our resources alongside some of the resistance machines that this, this person might prefer. Um, and in terms of the second part of the question, just around um, machines to avoid, I'd probably try to stick to machines that work multi joints together. So things like a leg press, um, a hack squat, a lateral pull down, a chest press are all quite similar to the, the exercises that we present in the resource rather than single joint machines, which are probably a little bit less time efficient and load bones or muscles a little bit less effectively. Thank you, lots of information there. Anything you wanted to add, Catherine? I think you were talking a little bit about the research and some of the research had used resistance machines. Uh, yes, yeah, so um, we've got some research using free weights, but also there has been some research using resistance machines as well. Um, some of which have shown benefits, but I'd agree with Richard that using a, a movement that uses uh, multiple joints, so you're not just doing an arm curl and bending the, the arm and you're using just one muscle group, um, is likely to be more effective and more um, efficient use of time. Thank you. Well, we're going to have to stop there. Time is up, but lots and lots of useful information. So I know you, our audience, will find that really useful. And I can only just encourage you to have a look at our range of new resources. That's 11 new films, uh, four on impacting exercise, six on muscle strengthening and our new exercise on exercising safely, which I'm sure you'll find really useful. So lots of details below and also we'd love any feedback, all helps us with developing any other new resources in the Bone Matters series. Thank you and goodbye.